Okay, um, so welcome everyone to the, the last network seminar of, of this term, also the last free, uh, fresh from the archive. Um, and today's talk will be given by uh, Lee Deville from University of Illinois. Um, and so it was fresh from the archive, but as we just talked about, it's already actually uh, published by now. So very quick process. Um, and what Lee's gonna be talking about is on consensus on simplicial complexes. So that's like nicely ties in with the sort of higher order structure things we've been hearing more about um, in the rest of the seminar series. So I'm, I'm very curious to see what it will be. So Lee, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Karen. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, so thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the, for the, the introduction. And uh, here's my title slide. And um, I'll just go ahead and is it looking good, uh, the slides and everything? As I change them, okay, excellent. So, uh, just a quick overview of, of the of the talk. And so, uh, as as Carol mentioned, so the 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 talk is based on a paper which you know I, I technically broke the rules because the paper now has appeared because it was so quick from from archive to actually be accepted. But um, I basically I, I want to focus on just one particular paper. And that'll be, so I'll talk about the results of the paper in section two of the talk, but I wanna start off with some background. Um, my, my, my guess is, is a lot of the things I'll say in the background in this seminar will be familiar to many people, but just to, to be comprehensive, I'll, I'll go through uh, some details. So the background here, let me go ahead and start. Uh, let me first talk about the Laplacian of a graph. So um, I, I give two definitions here, although they're equivalent, but let me go through them a bit carefully. So given a weighted graph, so G, I have some vertices, some edges, and some weights. I define the following matrix. And one way of thinking about this is that it's a matrix that's indexed by vertices cross vertices in terms of its size. And the ijth element of this, of this matrix is given by this formula. The off diagonal terms are given by minus the edge weight corresponding to that pair. And then the diagonal term is chosen so that the row sum is equal to zero, okay? And that's sort of the standard uh, definition of a graph Laplacian. Throughout everything I talk about here with graphs, I always assume uh, uh, undirected. So I assume the gamma ij equals gamma ji. So that makes this a symmetric matrix, okay? So in fact, the, it's, it's not only zero row sum, it's also zero column sum. Okay, so that's one definition. So give me a graph with some weights, here's a matrix. Where this really comes from, of course, is there's an operator. So if you give me a function on vertices, f, uh, I define a new function, Laplacian of f on vertices, given by the following formula, okay? Which looks a bit more complicated when you write it like this, but basically the idea is at vertex i, the value of this function is, I take f, I take the function at i, minus the function at the neighbors, weighted by the edge weight, sum over all neighbors, okay? Now, they look different, but they're actually exactly the same thing, uh, this matrix is the matrix representation of this operator in sort of the, the natural basis. Okay. So again, let's just, I'll just think of it at the matrix level. Uh, and, and of course, everything, all the graphs here, everything is finite, so a finite vertex set, et cetera. So here's the, here's the graph, here's the matrix. So here's some classical theory going back to the middle of the 19th century. And it says the following. So if, if all of the weights are non-negative, so if the gamma ij's are all uh, either zero or positive, then some results uh, follow from this. So first of all, the, the Laplacian is positive semi-definite, okay? And remember the Laplacian, I, I mentioned before, the Laplacian is symmetric, so it has real spectrum, but in fact, it has no negative eigenvalues. Moreover, the, the number of zero eigenvalues, the dimension of the kernel is exactly the number of connected components of the graph, okay? So if the graph is connected, it has uh, a simple zero eigenvalue. If the graph has multiple components, it has multiple zero eigenvalues. And equivalently to these two statements is if I look at the following flow, x dot equals minus Laplacian x, that is a stable flow, it's stable at the origin, right? It's because it's all of the eigenvalues are either zero or negative, and there's a translation invariance corresponding to the zero modes, however many there are, and then you decay exponentially in the other directions, okay? So very classical, uh, you know, 1850s, uh, I think Kirchhoff, I think this is the Kirchhoff proved all this. So, um, but in particular, if, if I write the flow in coordinates, so to speak, if I look at this flow, x dot equals minus lx, the ith component of that flow is given by this formula, okay? And notice that what happens is, is that it, the ith component is I'm coupled to all my neighbors, 
Uh, so gamma ij, so all the gamma ij's are positive, uh, show up in this formula, and it's xj minus xi. And basically notice that the signs have flipped because I've taken minus the Laplacian. And that's how, that's how we make the flow state. Okay, so very classical setup. But I just want to just remember this formula because something very similar will show up in a bit. But yeah, so let me just say three ideas in this talk that I want to touch on is first, what happens with the Laplacian when you have some negative edge weights? Okay, that's the non-classical case. Uh, what does it mean to non-linearize the Laplacian? Um, and uh, by, what does it mean to have a consensus model? And I know several people that are here today uh, know very much about this. And then finally, how do we extend this idea to, to bigger structures, hypergraphs, simplicial complexes, et cetera? Okay, so consensus model. So let me now write down uh, the following differential equation. So now, same setup, I have a, a graph, uh, vertices, edges, uh, and edge weights. Again, assuming symmetry. And pick your favorite function, phi, whatever it is. Um, and let me write down the following differential equation. Okay, and notice that this differential equation looks exactly like the linear flow, except instead of having xj minus xi, I have as some nonlinear function of xj minus xi. Okay, so you say, okay, that's a differential equation. I can do whatever I want with it. Now, let's say we have a fixed point. So let's say x star is an actual fixed point of this equation. And let me look at minus the Jacobian at that fixed point. And if you just crank it out, you get this formula. Okay. So notice that you know the off-diagonal terms, it's minus gamma ij times this factor that comes from the fixed point. And so and, and similarly for the diagonal terms. But I claim this is you, you, we can observe that this is also a graph Laplacian, right? And all I'm saying really is it's a zero row sum matrix with, of course, the potential cost that these numbers are now perhaps negative, right? So for example, if 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 you if, if you think about the case where if all the five, if phi prime of these numbers are all positive, well then then nothing has changed with the signs. But now it's possible that I'm, I'm effectively getting different weights on my Laplacian matrix, but with with perhaps changing sign. So the reason I mention this is because something I've thought about uh, quite a bit over the last few years is is what to do. How do you understand the spectral properties of uh, signed Laplacians, Laplacians where the edge weights could be negative? Um, thinking about the spectrum sometimes, in some cases, the eigenvalues typically, but sometimes the eigenvectors. So that's that's a very nice, rich question. And, and it, But I, I wanna point out that it's not just some abstract math question, like what happens if you change this thing? It really does show up in these models as a very natural question to ask, okay? Um, let me give one concrete example of, of a model that really fits in this category. And a very famous model is the Kuramoto system. Okay, so I'll write it like this, okay? Um, and notice the x's have changed to thetas because in the kernel moto, the, they're oscillators as opposed to points. But okay, I mean, obviously mathematically, it doesn't matter very much. And I just want to point out again, if you look at the Jacobian at a particular configuration, or again, I'm always plotting minus the, the Jacobian to make it look like a Laplacian. Of course, the, the this is the positive definite part we're hoping for so that its, it's, it's own negative will be negative definite. Um, so in any case, again, same story. The off diagonal terms look like minus gamma ij times a factor, which again is of indeterminate sign a priori. Okay, so the Jacobian of these systems is always a graph Laplacian, but with perhaps some weird negative weights. Okay, so now what can we say about uh, nonlinear Laplacians? So it turns out that um, how do we make a, a Laplacian nonlinear? And it turns out there's many ways to do this. Um, but, and I give some references in literature of how people have sort of approached this. And there are many ways to do this, but I wanna specifically focus on one way that involves the incidence matrix. Okay, so let me, let me sort of write down this calculation relatively briefly and, and go in the following way. So we have a graph. So every edge of the graph corresponds to a pair of vertices. Okay, and for now, let me write it as a set because it's it's a priori unordered. And let me now choose arbitrarily an orientation for each edge. And so I'll denote that as i goes to j is that I've decided to put the arrow that way. It doesn't matter how I choose these orientations as long as I'm consistent in, in my choice. And now let me define the matrix B, which is a non-square matrix or, or could be non-square. It's given by the, the rows are indexed by vertices, the columns are indexed by edges. Okay, and the formula is in each column, I have exactly a single plus one and a single minus one and everything else is zero. And wh where do I get this? So, so I think the really compact way is, is quite nice to see it is that given a particular edge, 
So if the vertex is the target of the edge, I put a plus one. That's what this delta function is. If the vertex is the source of the edge, I put a minus one. And that gives me the minus here. I'm, I'm saying that in the, in the third and fourth lines, I'm saying the same thing in, in sort of different ways. So let's call that matrix B. That's the incidence matrix of a graph or it's transposed depending on which, which source you look at, but okay. Um, and then let me also define this weight matrix as a diagonal matrix. And this looks like a little weird because we're, we're usually used to thinking of edges as indexed by pairs of vertices, but also I could just think of the set of edges as a list of edges. And so when I, when I write them like this, it's more natural just to index them by the edge. And it turns out that the Laplacian can be written in terms of this triple product. So B, W, B transpose. Okay, in fact, I'll, I'll, I'll check this in a second, okay? But the beauty of this is that the Laplacian now comes in, in sort of a form and notice that it's broken up. The, outs, the outer matrices correspond to sort of graph topology information and the middle matrix corresponds to the weighting information. They're separated up. Okay, so what's the proof? Um, the, the proof is not too bad, but I'll just, let me just talk about the details a little bit because it'll, it'll be useful in another context. So, so I want to prove that this is true. Okay, so let me just go ahead and compute some of the entries. So what is the ijth entry of BWB transpose? Well, let me just expand the triple product. There is not a double sum because the inner matrix, the inside matrix is diagonal. So there's really only a single sum. And when I just crank this out using the definitions, I get this uh, bit of nonsense. But then let me just look at this and note that I'm summing over all possible edges in the graph, but I'm fixing a pair ij. So basically what can happen is, is that if the edge is the pair ij, then this term will be non-zero. If the edge is not the pair ij, the term will be zero because one of these two or both will be zero. And then notice also with the sign, no matter what the orientation is for, for, for the edge, either it's i goes to j or j goes to i, this product is minus one. If i goes to j, I have a plus one minus one. If j goes to i, I have a minus one plus one or, or perhaps the other one. But in any case, they're always of opposite sign. So that means that the off diagonal term is always minus the edge weight. And then the very slick proof as to why the, why the diagonal term gives me a zero row sum matrix is what's beautiful about this is that B transpose has zero row sum. And remember, so remember B has exactly a one, a single one and a single minus one on a column. So B transpose has the same statement on a row. So it's zero row sum. And of course, if you take a zero row sum matrix, any left product of that matrix is also zero row sum. And that's the proof, of, that's the very, very short proof of that statement, which is a very nice statement from linear algebra. Okay, so that's classical. One, one can open up uh, Beggs's book, uh, Biggs's book or, or other books on this um, and see this. So now what do, how do we get the nonlinearity in there? So here's a way to do this. So let's let phi be any odd function. So take any scalar odd function from the reals to the reals. And now let me define a vector field in this kind of unusual way, which is the following. So phi on a vector x is the ith component of that vector field is the function little phi opposed to the ith argument, okay? So I'm using the same function in every component, but I want to stress that this vector field is not, you know, its range is not uh, vectors that are constant because of course different components are, it's the same function, but applied to perhaps different arguments. So, so more or less, I mean, this could be onto, in general it is. And it turns out that if I compute the following nonlinear vector field, B, W, phi, B transpose, that gives me the consensus model, okay? Or it gives me minus the consensus model. And that's the proof. And you say, okay, what's the proof of that? Well, the proof of that is, is the reason I went, I belabored the, the previous proof is the proof in the nonlinear case is exactly the linear proof, except there's a phi floating around, right? So when you take phi of this, then it's just phi of the components, and then you kind of crank it out and you basically get this, okay? So let me just summarize really quickly in terms of the background of this, okay? So when you think of it like this, what I'm really saying is, is if you take a Laplacian and you non-linearize it, and then you linearize it, you get a Laplacian, right? So when you think of it like that, uh, that's not so surprising, right? Somehow linearization and non-linearization sort of balance or in a way, but they're not quite inverses because I wanna stress that when you, when you compute this, the new Laplacian you get is not necessarily exactly the same Laplacian you started with because the weights may have changed, all right? So, and, and one can just sort of do this calculation. This is kind of a, a slightly messy calculation, but if you just take this vector field and you just crank out, what does its Jacobian look like, blah, 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 you get this. 
So it's basically the same B something B transpose, but the something has changed. The weights have changed, okay? And again, let me just, and again, this is just a diagonal matrix. So it is a, it is a weight matrix just with different weights, but let me, let me just slide back a few slides back to this formula. And you see, it's exactly the same thing is the ijth element is I get the graph, I get the original weight that I had in the graph times some factor that comes from this, uh, this function applied to the, the point. Okay, so that's, that's what this term corresponds to. But the thing, what I really love about this formula is at some level, this formula doesn't tell us too much because of course, the, the, this object, you know, phi prime of B transpose X can be quite complicated. And so the numbers can be very wild, but it tells us that if, if I'm willing to think of this inner product of these two, these, these in, uh, inner products, the wrong word, but the inside product of these two diagonal matrices as like a W tilde, it's telling me the new Laplacian is, has exactly the same topological information, right? The B and B transpose have not changed. It's the W that's changed, right? So that's that's kind of a nice fact, which is which is really, in, in, in the consensus literature, this isn't always explicitly said, but this is somehow always really at the heart of all the results, right? That when, when if you if you want to understand the linearization around any fixed configuration in a consensus model, it turns out that the graph topology does not change, which people exploit all the time, even sometimes when they don't when they don't say they're doing it. Okay, so that was background. Let me let me go on to to some to to what is sort of new here. I think so. First of all, um, let me first say so. How do we before I talk about how we get beyond networks? The first question you might ask is why. Okay, so I mean. Of course, as a mathematician, I mean, you know, sometimes it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's an obvious extension and it's cool, why not, right? But let me say it, it's more than that. Um, so let me, let me say that, and here, I think this, this literature review, which is not at all comprehensive, really makes the point that in, in several real application domains, neuroscience, biophysics, you know, social networks, people are really moving to the hypergraph framework as just saying, look, you know, graph, the graph theory, the pairwise interactions is just not enough. And, and uh, this is something that's, that's really, uh, really, um, you know, sort of big idea in science now. And, and, and this, the, you know, and a lot of the, the lot, you know, a lot of the things that I'm quoting here are not uh, necessarily math papers. These are papers in nature. These are papers in, you know, journal of neuroscience. This is real application domain stuff, uh, topological data analysis. And so, and, and also note, I, I, I think what's, what's really nice about this is if you look at the dates on this slide, um, I mean, I would say more than half of these papers are, are two or three years old or less, right? I mean, this is really kind of a, a topic that's really sort of blowing up. So it's, so it's, it's very timely in that sense as well. I also wanna stress that, um, although this isn't the first time that someone's even, that, that someone has done even a hypergraph consensus models like I'm, I'm presenting here, there, there are several papers uh, in this framework. And I wanna specifically point out two papers that, that, are, that are quite, you know, have, have a, quite a bit of overlap with uh, the results here. So there's Bianconi's paper and, and Grice's paper. Um, Bianconi's model is actually quite similar to what I'm going to present here, although they they look at it from a very they look at it, they do sort of more of a statistical physics approach as opposed to a, a math analysis approach, but it's the same sort of model. So there's there's a, there's a lot going on in this space. So I just want to be very clear uh, that that's that's um, sort of what's going on. But okay, so that's kind of where we're at in terms of in terms of scientifically. And so mathematically, what do we mean? So when I say we want to go from graphs to hypergraphs, all I'm just saying is is that I have a complex system. Instead of paying attention only to pairs or pairwise interactions, I want to look at higher order interactions, triples, quadruples, et cetera. Okay, and that's that's what it means to have a hypergraph. Um, so there's there's many such choices, and one can do many things. But one particular graph of one class of hypergraphs that is nice are simplicial complexes, and simplicial complexes have the property, you know. So a hypergraph is just you you decide which subsets of your vertex set. Or give possible interactions, the constraint, a simplicial complex just basically says the constraint is, is once you decide that a set is active, then all of its subsets have to be active, is basically, is basically what you're saying. So to say that uh, more formally, um, okay, sorry, you know, I'll say it like that. So, so, so I just wanna make a remark is that if, if you think of this at a purely sort of algebraic level, that's all a simplicial complex is, of course, What's interesting about simplicial complex is that they have a, they have a geometric interpretation, which which of course is is um, what makes them where you get all the cool pictures. So let me um, give some of a formal definition. So what is a simplicial complex? So pick any finite set you like. So I'll just call it vertex. That'll be a vertex set. Call it V. 
A K simplex is any list of K plus one of those vertices that, that are distinct. Okay, no problem. Um, a face of that simplex is what you do is, is if you take that set and you remove one element, you get a face. Okay. Um, a simplicial complex is a collection of simplices which is closed under inclusion of faces, as, as I said before, in terms of the subsets. Um, again, this I, I can see this definition is very abstract. I'll give a picture in a second. Um, so, and then the thing is, is that if you take the original vertex set, if you choose to order it in a certain way, you pick some ordering for it, that gives what's called an orientation, because that order is induced on all of the subsets. So typically when you have an unordered simplex, you just denote the you denote that by a curly bracket, like it's a set of points. But when you have a, when, once you've picked an orientation, you denote that by closed brackets. Okay, so here I have some set, and I and I've chosen a particular ordering throughout the entire complex. And what makes the, the algebraic topology work here, where the rubber hits the road, is that I have a um, I, I have a boundary operator. Okay, and so this is the definition of the boundary operator. So let me let me. Talk about algebraically, it's it's not super complicated. So given a D simplex, an oriented D simplex, which I have on the left hand side, that maps to a linear combination of D minus one simplices, right? Remember this 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 hat. Sorry, I don't think I actually defined this. I apologize. So this this uh, this hat notation means take given a list. It means just take the list with that element removed. So when I see this list with a hat, is that this is just I have D plus one elements and I throw one out, so I have D elements. So this is a map that, that sends uh, a simplex to simplices of a lower dimension or some linear combination thereof, All right? Let me show the picture. So this is the, 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 I think the picture many of us learned from the first time we ever saw this. This is the, one of the first pictures in Munkery's book. So what, what, is the, what is this boundary operator really doing? So I'll just, I'll just say, for example, so what it does is it, given a directed edge, right? So a directed edge, it, it gives me a linear combination of vertices, which is the target edge minus the source edge. That's just what it is. Okay. Given an oriented triangle, V0, V1, V2, well, the boundary of that is going to be three edges, right? And again, if, if I go back real quick, right, notice that a triangle, it, it's a two simplex, it's defined by three vertices, therefore its boundary is a linear combination of three things of lower dimension. So the boundary of a triangle is three edges, and if you look at this formula, the way it works, right? So for example, when I have the set V0, V1, V2, if I throw out V0, I get V1, V2. If I throw out V1, well, I get V, I get V0, V2, but then I get a minus sign in the formula, so it's V2, V0. And if I throw out V2, I get V0, V1. So in fact, this is, this is just a graphical representation of that previous formula. The oriented triangle basically gives you the boundary, right? Exactly what you expect. And similarly, if you take a tetrahedron with a certain uh, with a certain orientation, you get four oriented triangles, and so forth and so on. Okay, so let me review really quickly. Remember the differential equation. I claim that the consensus model is this this differential equation, B W nonlinearity B transpose, and I defined B by hand. But notice this is this is exactly the same formula I had ten slides ago. This is exactly the delta one operator, right? What am I doing? Is that on any edge, I give you a plus one at the target and I give you a minus one at the at the source. It's exactly this top line right here. That's all it is, just in matrix form, right? So this um, what this tells us is that a consensus model is really the the the, the delta one boundary operator with a nonlinearity sort of plugged into the middle. So the natural thing to do is okay, if 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 um, if, if, if I get the consensus model at the level of a graph by plugging a nonlinearity into the middle of the graph Laplacian, then a natural thing to do is to, for the simplicial complex is to write down the simplicial Laplacian and throw in a nonlinearity in a similar way. And in fact, this is, this is what we do. Um, so again, the first, so for now, forget, forget the omegas for one second, just ignore the omegas or set them equal to zero if you like, I'll, I'll talk about them in a second. So this term is the one we've already seen, except now instead of calling it B, I call it B1. Oh, also, I have no weights here for now. So let, I just want to simplify life. No weights. So I have B1, phi, B1 transpose. Now, uh, and, and again, that's something that people are, are very familiar with. Um, but in the, in the sort of simplicial world, there's also a D Laplacian. So the one Laplacian is a standard graph Laplacian, but there's the higher order Laplacian, which is given by this combination of these boundary operators. So it's, you, know, you apply B, you apply the boundary operator, then it's transpose. And then plus then you uh, the, the transpose of the other one times the boundary operator. And notice, remember what these do, 
So, so BD is the, is the boundary at level D. It takes D simplices and lowers their dimension. So B lowers dimension, B transpose raises dimension, effectively, because it, it just, or it just, it's, a, it's maybe not exactly right to say late raised dimension, but it, it, it basically takes, it takes simplices of a certain order and maps them up one level. Okay, so the way to think about this is that the Laplacian is, you know, basically you go down one level, come back, and then you go up one level and come back, and then you add those two together. That's Laplacian. So what I would say is, okay, we'll just take that Laplacian and just between the Bs, throw in a phi. Boom, just do the same thing. Okay. Certainly I can do that, right? You can't stop me from writing down this equation. Okay, so I'll, I'll argue in a minute why I should do this, but in any case, this is, this is, the, natural, <clears throat> this is the natural way to non-linearize the simplicial Laplacian at that level. And without the omegas, that's exactly all I'm doing. And then you say with the omegas, I'm doing this sort of um, analogous to the Kernamoto model. You can just think these are just, these are just forcing terms, right? So these are just terms that force the equation in some way or another. So these are just sort of fixed forcing terms, which, which are, Again, won't affect any sort of Jacobian calculation because they're constant, but they show up. Okay, so I'll write down the actual equations to study. I would claim are the weighted equations, all right? And so you say, okay, well, this there's a lot of weight uh, functions going on here. Um, so let me, for example, this equation one, uh, if you look at this, you say, okay, well, you threw in a bunch of weight functions. Why do you do that? Well, it, it turns out that the simplicial Laplacian Basically, if, if you take these equations and you throw out the phi, the algebraic geometers would tell you the simplicial Laplacian is ex exactly this. So, so there's actually, it's not a product of two terms, it's a product of four terms. So there's a weight on the outside, then, a, then an incidence matrix, a weight, you know, if you like a boundary operator, another weight and a boundary operator. And similarly, there's, there's two weights on the other side. So what I'm doing is, is the convention I'm always using is I'm plugging in the nonlinearity right after the application of the first boundary operator or its, or its dual. So in other words, here, there's a weight, then B, hit it with a phi. Here, it hits with a phi, put, put the weight there, okay? And that's, this is sort of the most analogous uh, uh, situation like this. Now, this looks really complicated, but, but here I give this, this chain argument. So in fact, I think, it's, I think it's this term right here. I just wanna make, I wanna make the argument that although this is a complicated term, it maps D simplices to D simplices. And, and here's sort of the argument why. So if I take if I take a um, if I take a linear combination of d simplices, if I take a, a d chain, so when I hit this thing with b d plus one transpose, that maps up to d plus one. Then of course phi is just this component-wise nonlinearity, so it doesn't change anything in terms of dimension. Then the weights also don't change anything in terms of dimension because of diagonal matrix. And then I hit this thing with b d plus one, it goes back down. And then I hit it with a weight matrix WD, which again, doesn't change dimension, it's diagonal. So you see that this entire chain, it's a bunch of steps, but it goes from CD to CD. It maps D simplices to D simplices. That's what this term does. Same story here. So each of these terms maps simplices, uh, simplices of a certain dimension to simplices of the same dimension. That's, that's, the, that's the trick. Okay. Um, let me give a, a, a perhaps involved example, but let me just say this is an example that can, that can pay a lot of dividends. So, so what I'm showing here is I'm showing this sort of small grid. So think of this as, as just, I just drew a small part for clarity. This could be part of a much bigger grid if you like. So this is just some triangulation of a surface. <clears throat> and so what I've done here is I have, I have a two by two grid of dots if you like, and I've triangulated in a very regular way where I index the, I index the vertices by VIJ. Um, I have three types of edges, horizontal, vertical, and, and diagonal. And I, and I choose a convention, you know, the convention I choose is that I always index, uh, I, I have H, D, and V edges, and I index them by sort of their, the index of their source. And then I also have these triangles, uh, the sigma R's and the sigma L's, which are like to the right and the left uh, half of these squares. Okay, so that's the convention. So on this particular system, what does the evolution equation look like? And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the evolution equation for the value on this edge right here. Okay, what is that going to be? Well, I claim it's this, and I'll talk you through it in a second, but notice this thing is, although it's complicated, it's relatively regular. So the right-hand side of this equation is, is a term of degree six, another term of degree six, and then two terms of degree three. I mean, degree is kind of in quotes here, but you kind of see where I'm, where I'm going with this. Where do these terms come from? Right? Where this term comes from, if I look at this edge, so for example, this edge, EIJH, the boundary of that edge is two vertices, right? This vertex and this vertex. And if I ask you, 
which six edges hit this vertex, because there's six edges around this vertex, it's exactly these six terms. And, and one can sort of, I mean, if you don't believe me, you could actually check, but look at it, right? So there's a IJH, IJV, IJ, IJD, those are the ones that come out. The ones that come in are, are these three and, and they're indexed right here, okay? Notice also the sign always works out that the sign of this term is negative. So the, the, the self-interaction term is always negative. And moreover, you can see by orientation is that at least at edges, is that every edge that kind of has the same orientation. So all the edges that come out of this vertex are negative. All the, all the edges that come into that vertex are positive. Okay, so that, that's where the sign comes from. And again, this is just, this is what, this is what you get <clears throat> if you compute uh, the thing using the boundary operator. The other term of degree six corresponds to this other vertex. And notice just because I've cut it off, there's actually two edges that aren't drawn here, but the two edges that would be drawn here appear in this expression. So you get these two terms. And then there, you also, so you might say, well, what about the terms of degree three? We'll also notice that this edge is the boundary of two triangles. And each of those triangles are what show up in these two terms. So for example, E, e I, J, H is the boundary of this triangle here. And there's gonna be I, I minus one J, B, I minus one J, D. And that's this term right here. Again, uh, minus signs when you share the orientation of that edge, uh, plus sign when you have sort of the opposite orientation. <clears throat> okay, so anyway, so so what's kind of nice is it, it's very clear that that and this, this is why this is nice. This very clearly encodes a lot of geometric information in, in this differential equation. And I say, okay, well, I don't really necessarily care about a two by uh, a three by three square or whatever. But now, just imagine, right now, I just have this system of equations, so I can extend this thing however I like, and in sort of an obvious way. And also notice that since I'm since I've uh, triangulated a surface, I can do various things with it. So, for example, I could turn the surface, and I could do a cylinder by identifying edges. I could do a torus. I could do a climb bottle. I can do whatever, whatever surface, almost any surface I want by, by doing the appropriate identifications. And so if I like, I can do consensus models on a Klein bottle, if you like, which is kind of cool. I mean, I, I don't really know what that means, but, it, but it's a cool idea. Okay. Um, <clears throat> just, just for completeness, I'm writing all, all, all the um, edge uh, differential equations right here. Okay. So, um, okay. So anyway, th this thing's a bit uh, complicated, but let me just say, okay, let's, let's get some results here. So, <clears throat> The first claim is, is I claim that there's a class of solutions. I call them homological solutions for a reason that I'll explain in a bit. And I claim that there's a class of solutions you can get that live in a linear space given by this quantity. Okay, so it's basically this kernel intersect that kernel. You say, okay, where does that come from? Let me slide back to the equations really quickly. And let me point out, I don't know if I actually said this, but here I'm using the convention. I wanna use the convention that little phi of zero is zero. And therefore, big phi of the of the origin is the origin, right? So it maps zero to zero. And now look at this. If I choose a vector that's in the kernel of B D plus one transpose, well, then this is zero, 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 all zero all the way down. If it's also in the kernel of B B D W D, then zero, zero, zero all the way down. So it's a fixed point, right? Again, assuming no forcing. So this always gives me a fixed point. It's kind of the, the, the trivial thing, just because the nonlinearity maps the origin to the origin, it's more or less a linear calculation. So it turns out that if you assume that all the weights are non-negative, the homological solutions are always locally stable, dynamically, right? So the, the way to think about this is, is for people that are, say, familiar with the Kuramoto model um, or, or, or general condensed model on the graph, the homological solutions correspond to the constant vectors. Right, because the constant vector is the thing that's 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 in the kernel of both B and BD transpose, um, and uh, those are always locally stable. There's always this translation invariance in, in a Kuramoto model. Here, you just have a higher dimensional translation invariance given by the homology, and in particular, um, the reason I call these homological solutions is because exactly this, the dimension of the span of these solutions is exactly the deep level homology of the graph, and and to sort of see why that's true. So it turns out that um, this is kind of, it's, so if you ignore the weight here, so basically the vectors that are in the kernel of B and in the kernel of B transpose are exactly the, the so th these are exactly the terms that show up when you do the homological calculation, because you look at things that are, that are cycles that are in this kernel that, that are also uh, boundaries, which mean, so you say, well, what, how does that come from a kernel? But remember, the kernel of something transpose is the orthogonal complement of the image of that thing, right? So those are the those are those are exactly the representatives of um, the, the co-cycles. So 
in fact, this is this I call them homological solutions because they're not they're not exactly right because there's a there's a re, there's a renorming here from this WD, but okay, so you get that linear space. So in particular, if you look at the edge flow for so if you look at the previous example, and I, and I think of this as a torus. So, so take this thing and wrap it around, wrap it around. The, in, the, in the edge flow equations, you're always gonna have a two-dimensional null space because the torus has Z2, uh, you know, Z squared um, uh, cycles uh, in it, okay? And let me just say really quick, without, without showing the entire proof uh, due to time, but, but just to give the ideas, um, the basically the, the plan of the proof is, is, is as follows. So if I compute the Jacobian at a homological solution, <clears throat> I get exactly the D Laplacian. I get exactly the simplicial to, uh, with a minus sign, okay? Classical result uh, and, and somewhat later result. So the graph, the simplicial Laplacian is always positive semi-definite, okay? Uh, this is proved by Ekman in 43 for the unweighted, so that's a very classical result for the unweighted uh, simplicial complex. And Horst and Jorak uh, proved more recently for, for the general weighted simplicial complex. This is always positive semi-definite. And of course, I'm taking minus that. So just like, just like it works for the graph, okay? I get linear stability. But then you say, well, wait a second, right? I have a bunch of zero eigenvalues. I have a nonlinear differential equation with zero eigenvalues at the origin. So I don't actually know I'm stable just from the linear analysis, right? I can't, I can't, um, I can't use hartman grumman because I'm all, I got imaginary, I got, I give values on the imaginary axis, so to speak. So it turns out there's energy methods, and I'll say more or less. I mean, it's basically just you, once you once you guess the right energy functional, it sort of follows. And so I'll just say, you know, basically, uh, this is it. So so in other words, it turns out that you can write down explicitly a functional, the energy. And again, this is this is here for the forcing for those that like the forcing. But if you like, just set little omega equal to zero here. And you just get these two nice terms. Um, and it turns out that the flow that we've been talking about is just this rescaled gradient flow. Okay. And, and where does this where does this thing come from? Well, the idea is that so phi is my nonlinearity. So I just take any antiderivative I like. Of course, the convention is usually take the antiderivative that's also zero at zero, and then just write down this crazy thing. Notice that um, you know, this is uh Right. This is this is just you know a calculation, and then it turns out that you can compute that that up to a rescaling, uh, up to a up to a diagonal rescaling. This is exactly uh, the gradient flow. And I, and I'll say one comment is that it's more explicit here, where this is the this is the Euclidean gradient. If you don't like the term that's showing up at front, even though it is sort of a, it, it doesn't really change much in terms of the the, the dynamics, um, or it doesn't change much in terms of the 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 stability, uh, you can redefine a, a, an inner product on RD on, on the appropriate uh, space so that this gets absorbed into the gradient, if you like. But okay, whatever. Um, so let me just say, and then the proof goes like this. So, so assuming that assuming that my nonlinearity has the property. So remember, we we assume that it's equal to zero at zero, and assume that it has a positive derivative. Then this nonlinearity is locally convex in a neighborhood of the zero. Um, and, and strictly convex because of this positive thing. And so basically the proof is that in every direction, except these homo, so the homological solutions, everything is flat. And then in the other directions, it curves up. It's, it's strictly convex, right? And so basically LaSalle's principle, you, 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 know, you always relax to this, this linear manifold and, and there's just no, there's no hope. And that gives you stability. So I'll say the trick is that when you, you for example, if you plug in the zero vector, that's dynamically stable. Although to be a little bit careful is that um, you can get drift along this, this axis. So for example, if you give me a perturbation of say zero, it's gonna relax back to one of these homological solutions, but maybe not zero, maybe maybe something else in this plane. Um, which is, and I also say, I mean, just to, to, to put that in more concrete terms, back at Kuroboto, right? If I, take, if I take all the oscillators, if I set all the oscillators to zero and I look at some perturbation, that's gonna relax back to all the oscillators being equal, but maybe not zero, right? Uh, it might be shifted, that, that's, all, that's all I'm saying. Okay, so the beautiful thing is that if oh, Can I ask sorry. a question, yeah, yeah um, of about the previous slides too. So, because you yeah. say here, um, like any of these systems is like a gradient dynamical system. Um, yeah. So, does that also holds for Kuramoto model and things like that, oscillator models? Um, yeah. So, so when when you have the Kuramoto system, mm -hmm. uh, so again, if if the omegas are zero, uh, so if there's no forcing, the Kuramoto system is a gradient system. 
Um, and in fact, it, it actually has exactly this form where it, it, it would, it's going to be, um, it's going to be exactly, it's, it'll be exactly this where it's like some gamma ij cosine uh, thetas, basically. Okay. So, so, so that there's like no natural frequency type of thing. Is that the? Yeah. So, so that's when the omega is equal to zero. When so okay. so when, okay. when when there's no forcing, uh, the Kerbal system is, is a pure gradient system. When you add in the omega, you basically add this linear shift. Uh, and so, if you think I, the 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 picture I like, and exactly the same pictures here, is I think of like an egg crate. So Kuramoto mm -hmm. is like an egg crate model with all these things. And then you add a linear shift, and if if the shift is still small, you kind of live inside one of these egg holes. If the shift is big enough, you start running down. Uh, the thing, and that's exactly what you see in Kuramoto is, is if you spread the velocity, you spread the forcing too much, these guys start precessing around the circle. Uh, mm -hmm. and they, they're basically falling downhill, this sort of, they're, they're sort of dripping down the egg crate, so to speak, is a, the, yeah. the image that I like. It's, it's exactly the same thing here. So in fact, um, in general, uh, this, this potential can be multi-stable, it could have multiple uh, fixed points. And so tilting it, which is what comes from the forcing could, could lead to, uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just just the reason I'm asking is because there's also a way of writing like Kuramoto as a Hamiltonian system, so with another energy function, and then instead of like having gradient, you you have like a conservation of energy. So I'm wondering, like, it's weird that these two things can both be. But I guess yeah, so it's just I've, a different formulas. Yeah. It, it is so. So I think I've seen something like this where, yeah, in some set of variables. So Kuramoto, I think. I think what I think is true is that the Kuramoto system and, and probably these systems, although I haven't thought about this, I think they embed inside a Hamiltonian system. Um, and, and so on that particular, so there's a conserved, there's, there's a basically a conserved quantity that you live on, mm -hmm. but on that conserved quantity, you're gradient. It's kind of, it's kind of a weird. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, I guess, I mean, maybe we, we, I'm very happy to talk more about it offline, in fact, uh, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So yeah. So so yeah. Let me just just say really briefly. So so if the if the if the potential function is is convex, then you get exactly more or less a unique fixed point at the origin modulo this the shift of these homological solutions. So the one thing. Uh, sorry. And I just want to give here's a picture. So just just to get the impression that it's not. Sorry. I have no idea why that that pop up is weird. Um, this is what one of these homological solutions look like. So what I've done here is I've, uh, as I've taken this, this, um, this triangulation we saw before, and I, I put it on a, a 10 by 10 torus. So basically I, I extended a 10 by 10 and then and identified the edges like this. And then I just said, you know, Mathematica, you know, give, me, give me a random sort of, literally just give me some element in this space, in this linear space. And it pops out this thing which is just, it's not that regular, right? So I just want to stress, right? It's just, so, so basically this is, so what I'm, what I'm plotting here is these are, um, you know, it's there's I, J, I, I and J go from zero to nine, and then there's the diagonal edges, the horizontal edges and the vertical edges. So there's 33 variables here. And I'm just sort of plotting them in this weird way. And there's really no, I mean, this is just one, and of course there's a two dimensional subspace of such examples. Of course, you know, one solution also is everything is equal to zero. Right, that's a fixed point, but you get this other thing. So I, I don't know. It, it's 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 a little bit disordered, but it, it is what it is. Um, but let me just say uh, really quickly. So so the thing that I find really interesting, and I mentioned this, this great question because I'm thinking about this egg crate picture. So so in Kuramoto, you know, the fact that you have a sine function means that your potential is not convex because it's got it's got multiple sort of equa equi deep wells. So you can end up with all these different. Um, uh, you can end up with multiple fixed points. So can you do the same thing with complexes? So let me just say, I'm looking at the time, so let me just, I'll, I'll go through this relatively quickly, but let me just go back to Kuramoto. And so if I look at the nearest neighbor Kuramoto system on the circle, so here it's a situation where I'm only coupled to my, I'm, you know, I is coupled to I plus one and I minus one, that's it. That's the differential equation. You can check that, okay, so first of all, setting all the theta is equal is a fixed point. Because if all the phases are equal, then everything that gets zero plus zero. But moreover, I can do this thing called a twist solution. So if I take a solution that I twist around the circle and, and I go all, so I come back to the origin after n steps, then this is also a fixed point. Because for example, notice that the, all the angle differences are the same so that I get a plus term here and a minus term there, sine is odd so that they cancel, okay? And so these are known as twist solutions. And these are these have been known by the Kuramoto system for quite a while. People study these. 
And more generally, uh, not just this one example. So for example, whenever the gamma, whenever the edge weights are circulant, you also can get twist solutions. And so basically just because things balance. And it, it uses the oddness of sign very strongly though. That's, that's something that's important. So let me give a, a geometric picture. Um, so these are, so when I take N equals nine, so I have nine oscillators on a circle and I arrange them in this way. Okay, of course I can put all the oscillators at zero, that's a fixed point, but I can also arrange them to twist around the circle, say one time or two times. Uh, let me first argue why this is a fixed point. We'll notice, for example, look at oscillator one. Well, oscillator one is being pulled this way by oscillator zero, being pulled that way by oscillator two, but the poles match, right? They're exactly the same distance so that there's a balance. So this is a fixed point. That's also a fixed point. It's not clear from that argument why it's stable, but it's certainly a fixed point. So if I look at the Jacobian of this map, well, check this out. So this one twist, it turns out the Jacobian of this map is, you could just compute it, it's this, okay? Which looks a bit complicated, but if you look at it, it's basically, it's this number cosine two pi over nine times some matrix, right? That pulls all the way out. And it's just the one minus two, one Laplace. It's just the graph Laplace you know, of the nearest neighbor graph. So what that's telling me is that, uh, and remember the, the thing we argued earlier, <clears throat> is that if I take any configuration of this model, right? Since the graph Laplacian is the one minus two one Laplacian, any configuration of this model will have the same topology, but with perhaps different weights. In this case, all the weights are the same just because this is such a regular solution, right? Of course, that wouldn't always be true. Uh, same story here, except now it's cosine four pi over nine, which is also positive. So again, a positive scalar times Laplacian will still be stable. Um, so, but let's, let's look at this in terms of the incidence matrix. So if I think about the nearest neighbor Laplacian, sorry, the nearest neighbor graph, the incidence matrix can be written this way, right? So notice that, that every, you know, every there's, you know, for example, the first edge goes from one, uh, two to one, second edge goes from three to two and so forth. That's the choice I made. And when I plug this twist solution into the matrix B transpose, I get something kind of weird. I get something that's a bunch of alphas and then a two pi plus alpha. And you can just kind of check. And the reason is basically because, you know, it's this twist solution. So this is this minus this. So I get minus two pi over nine, minus two pi over nine, minus two pi over nine, minus two pi over nine. But then when I wrap around, I get plus 16 pi over nine. So that's two pi more than this. So that's not, this is not in the kernel. This is not what you call a homological solution. But, Remember, I hit this thing with a nonlinearity, and, and in Kuramoto, the nonlinearity is a sine, and of course, sine is two pi periodic. So sine it sees alpha and two pi plus alpha, and it deals with them in the same way. They're both, both beta, right? So what's kind of cool about this is that this thing is not in the kernel of B transpose, but when I hit it with the nonlinearity, it's still a non-zero vector, but then it's in the kernel of B, which is kind of cool. Okay, so. One can, so this is, a, this is an example. One can sort of use the same uh, kind of idea to, to generate um, uh, uh, what I would call a twist-like solution for these more complicated complexes. So now instead of a vertex flow, I, I can construct it for the edge flow. And basically, okay, I've seen the time, so just a bunch of details here, but basically there's a particular complex that I write down and I can show that if I take this particular solution, okay, and, and Basically, where this comes from is, is sort of staring at the wall and, and trying a bunch of different things until I can get the thing to work out exactly. Um, but notice that this particular configuration has the property that when I hit it with B2, it's equal to zero. So it's homological in that sense, but when I hit it with B1, it's not zero. It's some number, some number, some number, and then some number plus two pi, exactly analogous to the twist solution in Kuramoto. And, and then, Bunch of work later, which I won't show, it turns out that when n is bigger than four, this is a stable solution. One can check this. So nonlinear is stable and everything, and you can do numerics. So um, this exhibits right here. So, so in a simplicial complex, you could have multi-stability. Here's, here's an example, right? So um, what is, uh, what's, what's very fascinating to me and what's something I don't know how to do is this is a really cool example, and you, you can construct several examples of this class, but can you characterize these types of examples? And I, I, don't, I, I can't see quite how to do it. So uh, even for, for things on, on, on a graph oscillator networks, it's, it's, it can be quite difficult. So for example, you know, things like the twist solution is hard, but if somebody just hands me a graph and says, you know, characterize you know, the non-zero solutions of the Kuramoto model on this graph, this sometimes can be, can be quite challenging. So, 
Um, so that, so it, it, it's too much to hope that there's going to be some some answer that just gives it, but it, it'd be nice to understand this more. So this is something I don't know exactly how to do. Um, and then let me just I'll just uh, I'll just give a couple of slides on some on some things that, that I'm thinking about uh, doing next. So um, and here's one thing that I find really interesting. So this is so uh, I just want to point out. So my, my former postdoc Eddie Nyholt, who's now at uh, uh, Sao Paulo, or he's not. Uh, it's COVID, so he's not actually at Sao Paulo. He's in Europe, but he's you know <laughs> he's in, uh, but he's he's virtually. You know. So. Um, uh, he's, you know, we worked on a lot of different things, but he's really interested in, in, uh, in network symmetries and sort of thing. In fact, I should mention, he's giving, uh, so the, the One World Dynamics talk, I think the, the, the talk in Berlin, he's actually giving this talk, I believe, later this week, in fact. So uh, if, if you're interested in network symmetry, you should, you should see his stuff. But um, so we're, we're playing around with this, and we have some partial results. And so, so the idea is, is notice in, so you have this simplicial structure, and what we did before what I did, what, what I've talked about so far today is, is assume that um, the nonlinearity is the same in every direction. So it's a very special sort of nonlinearity. And now that's chosen so that it looks like a consensus model. But more generally, right, at this stage in the, in the development, so for example, once I hit, you know, the vertices with this, and it, it just some, it's some function on the edges, well, any map, any nonlinear map, I could just plug in there if I like. So the question is, what can we say about the system when it still has this structure that respects the simplicial complex, but I have a general <clears throat> nonlinearity. <coughs> and what it turns out it's, it's quite nice is that you actually get a very robust set of, um, uh, of differential equations. So you can't get every differential equation on the right-hand side. There are some constraints. So, I mean, for example, this thing must be in the range of B1, if you like, or obviously, right? There's, it's not just arbitrary, but, um, more or less, there's 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 an isomorphism. There, there's basically a, a subspace. So so basically, if you think if you look at this first equation, for example, instead of saying you know this, I can't get any nonlinear vector field on the set of edges that I like, but any nonlinear vector field that satisfies a family of linear constraints, which correspond to basically being in the edge space, more or less, can be can be realized this way. So basically, you can any dynamics you like, you can impose on a, on a simplicial complex, right? If you if you want, you want to put a Lorenz oscillator on there, you could do that, right? Uh, you could sort of just do it by hand by picking things. Um, and in particular, uh, the thing that's really interesting is is when um, like all the algebraic theory you have about networks is when when the network when the graphs of the network satisfy certain symmetries, you can you get symmetries in the dynamics. And we're really trying to um, sort of translate all that stuff into the simplicial. Uh, into the simplicial framework, which is it's very it's very exciting about it. It's a it's a bit work in progress now, but I just want to I'll mention it. it's 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 really kind of cool. Another thing uh, which I've been playing around with a little bit, I, I don't really have much uh, intelligence to say about it, but I just want to point out something I've thought about a lot in my in my past mathematical life. If, if you like, uh, you know, former before reincarnation, I was doing all these other things with stochastics. Um, so. So, you know, when someone hits me with a with a gradient system, a very natural thing to do is to add noise and understand uh, the stochastic dynamics of this thing. And I'll just say is that gradient systems are actually quite nice for this because there's the wenzel friedland theory, which tells us that. Um, so in general, if you if you give me a, if you give me a gradient dynamical system and I'm looking at the deterministic picture, I just need to find the attracting fixed points, and that's it. And then you just have to figure out what the basins of attraction are. When you have noise, of course, you can transition between these points. But it turns out that if all if you understand the sinks and the the one saddle, so the saddles with one unstable direction, um, and then the, the homoclinic connections, or I guess I, I should say heteroclinic connections here, then that tells you everything you want about the transitions. Uh, you get the invariant measure. You get you get the the most likely transitions and points like this. Um, this is something I, I did quite a while ago for the Kuramoto model, and so it's a natural thing to do it here as well. And so uh, to try to understand. You know, when you have, of course, when you only have a unique fixed point, not much interesting happens when you add noise. You just get a little Gaussian by the unique fixed point. But when you have multiple fixed points, you can get transitions, especially when they have different depths. You can get transitions, you know, again, this egg picture. So, you know, when I said this egg crate, so imagine, you know, the, the way to think about this is that in the, in the flat egg crate, nothing is super interesting. Um, everything is just sort of super symmetric. If you tilt the egg crate really far, then, then the things run downhill. If you tilt it, less so that the things don't run down deterministically, they can still run down stochastically because you can kind of you can kind of bounce out of the well. 
And so this whole picture, yeah, I mean, it's it's always you you always get these really cool graphics at least. And so there's there's a lot of nice theory there that I, that I'm playing with as well. So I just want to give some coming attractions. Um, but this is not not quite done. Um, and I think that's it. So I think uh, I think I stopped just about on time, which is which is which is amazing somehow. But anyway. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, okay, so are there, I think there's time for like a quick question or maybe two. Um, see if anyone has one. I have a bunch, but uh, I want to uh, leave the others uh, an option as well. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I can ask my question, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's maybe a bit of a detail, but I was just wondering, um, so you've shown some of these solutions you found, like the, these homological solutions. Do you yeah. find them based on, um, like, on the on the, the homology space already, and then you do like a rescaling, or how do you find them? Well, so in this case, um, I mean that's one way to think about. It. So, so as I said, yeah. So, so for example, here, if if the W is not here. These are exactly the representatives of the homology, because these are these are yeah. I guess these are cycles, and then this condition is tells me that they're sort of the, they're the representatives of the co-boundaries. Yeah. Um, so so in general, these are not um, these are not exactly those things because of these weights. Of course, if the weights are all one, then they are the same. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so in a particular model, so for example, in, in the numerics I showed, I just you know in that particular case, I had you know, the B, I had the information, I knew it B1, or in this case, I guess it was B2, you know, I, or yeah, B1 and B2. I sort of mm -hmm. knew what they were by hand. And so I just said, you know, mathematically, give, give me the null space of these of these two things. Okay. Yeah. Um, that, that's purely numerical. Um, but it turns out that one can show that as long as, the, you know, as, long as these, all these WDs are positive here, um, it turns out that these you won't get exactly the same homological solutions, but you don't change the dimension of the space. So that's why it's the, mm -hmm. the, the signature, you know, the, the number of degrees of freedom is the same, even though the, the, the yeah. vectors themselves are not. So yeah, so in fact, what the interpretation of these vectors are, I don't know. I mean, they, they just, they, 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 they would pop out of the differential equation, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I see there's, there's one more question by Gizina. Um. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. Oh, um, at, at the end, I expected you to say it. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm not I don't think I hear you. Oh, okay. Sorry, try again. Yeah. Can, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, so um, my, my question is, um, how hard would it be to look at other structures of hypergraphs? So, yeah, good question. Um, so I guess I, I, I don't really know uh, in, in, a, in a sense of, um, so hard, I mean, I guess hard is a subject. It's, it's, so it's a great question. So it's the very natural next question. Um, so for me, the, the, the reason to do the simplicial stuff is because, you know, I'm sort of uh, thinking of this as Laplacian focused. So the simplicial complexes have a natural Laplacian. Um, I, my understanding is in the hypergraph context, although one can define, there's actually sort of a competing, uh, I, I, my understanding is, in the, in, I could be wrong here, but I think there are actually several things that people talk about as the hypergraph Laplacian, which are not exactly the same thing. And they all have different nice properties. You know, the, the, you know, this operator has shares these nice properties of the graph Laplacian, but not those. And, and so there's, there's, so, so, and, and again, maybe there are experts more than me that know this. Uh, whereas in the simplicial context, there is sort of this D Laplacian. It's a positive definite operator. I mean, basically, that's why I kind of fixed on it. Is I'm saying, okay, this is something. This is an object that more or less works like the graph Laplacian. And so there's a hope that this would all work. Um, I, yeah, I mean, so so I don't I don't I don't know that there's um, there's any. I mean, of course, one one can do a similar construction. I think, you know, you you could certainly define. Um, well, actually, I don't know. I mean, so I, I don't know exactly how to define a boundary operator for a general hypergraph. I mean, I think that's the real. So so I don't know exactly how to extend this family. 
uh, for a simplicial complex, the boundary operator is well defined, but for a hypergraph, right? Because, you know, in a hypergraph, you know, a priori, you could have like a triangle and the edges aren't even there. I don't, I don't even, I mean, I, I'm sure there's a sensible way to do it, but I don't, I don't quite know what it is. So I guess where, where I would be stuck is I'd have to think about what the model is uh, there. Um, so, so yeah, I, I agree. I mean, this is, this is a, this is not, you know, there's, there's certainly, uh, you know, models that people have out there that don't fit into this framework. I mean, absolutely. Uh, but I'm, I'm not, I mean, no, it's, it's a great question. So, I mean, I think it's, it's very natural uh, for people to think about that next. Absolutely. Yeah. I guess. Thanks. I'm not sure I answered the question, but I think I danced around it uh, enough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.